the invention of the balloon is really extraordinary. It's the story of a competition between two technologies, hot air and hot balloons filled with hydrogen gas. And it takes place very quickly uh, between June of 1783 and December 1st of 1783. The story began with two brothers, Jacques and Etienne Montgolfier, uh, two French papermakers, fascinated by the science of the period. They began by noticing that hot air rises, and as papermakers, they began building small balloons, filled them with hot air, and kept getting larger. Uh, they made their first public flight from the town square of their hometown, Annonay, France, on June 4th, 1783. When the news of what these guys down in the provinces had achieved worked its way to Paris, the Parisians wanted to see whatever it was the Montgolfiers did down there to make something fly. They wanted to see it for themselves. And so a group of uh, savants, scientists, uh, passed the hat and gave the money to a chemist, a fellow named Jacques Charles. Well, Jacques Charles was um, a better chemist than the Montgolfiers were, and it didn't even occur to him that they had built a balloon and filled it with hot air and it flew. He knew all about Hydrogen uh, wasn't even called hydrogen yet, but this very light gas that's a constituent of the atmosphere. He knew that what we call hydrogen now was so much lighter than um, ambient air that if you filled a bag with it, it was going to fly. This first flight in a hot air balloon uh, that the, the Montgolfiers sent up was fairly short. Uh, they only flew about five miles and uh, weren't in the air for very long. Uh, the problem with hot air balloons is that once they begin to cool off, of course, they come down. And so the Montgolfiers had put a little brazier, a little furnace inside the neck of the balloon. And these guys spent the whole flight kind of tossing straw briquettes uh, into this brazier to kind of keep themselves aloft. But uh, they actually came down pretty quickly and safely. So the Montgolfiers had succeeded in sending the first human beings aloft. But Jacques Charles wasn't very far behind them. Ten days after the Montgolfiers had sent the first human beings up, Jacques Charles and Marie-Noël Robert, who had helped him build his balloon, flew as the first human beings aloft on a hydrogen-filled balloon. And since hydrogen technology was um, sort of more efficient and practical than hot air technology at the time, they made a much longer flight, stayed up longer, uh, actually rose as high as 6,000 feet, much higher than the Montgolfier balloon had flown, and uh, landed safely. So... Um, it was an extraordinary period between the first flight the Montgolfiers had made on June 4th, 1783, and the first human beings to fly in a gas balloon, a hydrogen balloon, on December 1st, 1783. The whole thing had happened in a period of about nine months, and uh, the air age had begun with those flights. Balloons were the first flying vehicles and humanity's first experience of the flying environment. With the Montgolfier brothers' first adventures into the sky and coursing through to today, balloons allow us to escape the confines of Earth. And lighter-than-air balloons don't really depend on aerodynamics and typically don't have propulsion devices on board, so they are a relatively easy way to get off the ground. The freedom of this mode of flight, even the act of surrender to where the winds take us, invites us in for a deeper look 
at the science behind balloon flight. In the grand narrative of aviation, while balloons were the first way to get in the air, it may be surprising to realize that it wasn't until the end of the 20th century that two men in the Breitling Orbiter 3 became the first to circumnavigate the globe in a balloon, making their trip around the world in less than 20 days. Jules Verne would have been pleased at their speed, but why hadn't anyone done that before? Why was it such a big challenge? In this lecture, we'll work our way up to the Breitling Orbiter by exploring the lift-carrying capacity of balloons, and the reasons why pressure and temperature are so low at higher altitudes. Let's begin with buoyancy. This is the fundamental physical principle behind balloon flight. Whether flight is in a hot air balloon, or a helium balloon, or a hydrogen-filled zeppelin, the fundamental principle is the same. The lifting force acting on the balloon is produced by buoyancy. This is the same buoyancy that we experience when we float in a pool, and it's the same buoyancy force that makes all ships float on water. Archimedes experimented with his body in a tub of water, and he recognized that the force causing his body to float is equal to the weight of the water displaced by his body. If you want to find the buoyancy force acting on your body in a tub of water, the simplest thing to do is to fill the tub up to the brim, then carefully ease yourself into the water. If you collect all of the water that spills over the edge of the tub, that's the amount that you, has been displaced by your body, as long as you don't splash around too much. Then take the collected water that was displaced and weigh it on a scale. The weight of that fluid is exactly the same as the buoyancy force. This is the idea behind Archimedes' principle. And this is the whole idea of lighter than air flight. It may not be immediately obvious, but the exact same principle applies to gases as well as liquids, since both are fluids. So let's explore how Archimedes' principle applies to balloon flight. For a balloon, the force of buoyancy pushing up on the balloon is equal to the weight of the air displaced by the balloon. Now the actual net lift that pushes the balloon upward will be the difference between the buoyancy force and the weight of the balloon itself. Of course, the full weight of the balloon would include the payload, the material of the balloon envelope, and the weight of the gas inside the balloon. So in order to determine the amount of buoyancy force acting on a balloon, all we have to do is find the weight of the air that is pushed aside by the presence of the balloon. But how can we find the weight of air? Well, we can measure the volume of the balloon, and if we know something about the density of air, then we can get the mass of the displaced air. Density is simply a measure of how many gas molecules are present in a given volume. We measure it as mass per unit volume. So density of air times volume will give the mass of air. But the mass of air is not the same as its weight. The weight can be found by recognizing that Earth's gravity pulls down on the mass, creating the force that we know as weight. So weight is found simply by multiplying mass times gravity. So pulling these ideas together, the weight of the air displaced by a balloon is simply the product of balloon volume, density of air, and gravity. Let's try this out on a small weather balloon that I have with me here. This balloon is just like the balloons that the National Weather Service launches at sites across the United States multiple times every day. The purpose of those numerous balloon flights is to collect atmospheric data that the Weather Service uses to feed into computational models for weather forecasting. So let's find the buoyancy force. First, I'll measure the volume of this balloon. I can take a piece of string and wrap it around the balloon to measure its circumference. And Josh, could you help me with that, please? Thank you. So I've got the circumference wrapped around completely. I'm just gonna mark it with my finger. And then take this and measure it out on yardstick. So I've got one length, two lengths, three lengths, four lengths, plus about an inch. So that gives me 145 inches. Then from the relationship between circumference and radius, I get the radius to be 23.1 inches. And taking this with the equation for the volume of a sphere, we find that the volume is 29.8 cubic feet. Okay, we need, now need to get the density of air in this room. Density is difficult to directly measure, but I can make measurements of temperature and pressure 
and find density from what is called the ideal gas law. This law states that the density is simply the pressure divided by the temperature and a gas constant, R. The gas constant describes how much energy there is in a mass of gas at a given temperature. Each particular gas has its own constant, based on the molecular weight of the gas. The ideal gas law is a very useful relationship when we work with aerodynamics, since knowledge of two of the three properties, pressure, temperature, or density, automatically ensures knowledge of the third. Satisfying the ideal gas assumption means presuming three conditions that are common in aerodynamics. Air pressure isn't too high, temperature is not so low that the air is condensing into a liquid, and gravity is neglected. Given the ideal gas assumptions, if we know pressure and temperature, then we can easily find density. Using measurements of pressure and temperature for the air in this room, along with the gas constant for air, we find that the density is 0 0.002377, slugs per cubic foot. Now, what exactly is a slug? Well, it's a quirk of the English unit system. It's simply a unit of mass that causes a weight of 32.2 pounds at Earth's surface. All right, we're now ready to pull everything together to calculate the buoyancy force acting on this balloon. We found the volume of the balloon to be 29.8 cubic feet, the density to be 0 0.002377 slugs per cubic foot. Multiplying these gives the mass of the displaced air as 0 0.0708 slugs. Finally, we multiply this mass by Earth's gravity, 32.2 feet per second squared, and we get 2.28 pounds. That's the buoyancy force. Now, let's say we want to find the lift carrying capacity of this balloon. It's a critical question to address in balloon flight. The lifting capacity of the balloon has to be at least as high as the weight of the payload. So the lift carrying capacity of the balloon is the buoyancy force offset by the weight of the balloon material and by the weight of the gas inside the balloon. For our balloon, the latex material itself weighs 350 grams, or 0.77 pounds, and the balloon is filled with helium, which is 7.2 times lighter than air. So if we take the weight of our displaced air and divide by 7.2, we'll find the weight of the helium, since the volume and density of the two is about the same. This gives us 0.32 pounds for the weight of the helium. So taking the buoyancy force of 2.28 pounds and subtracting off the weight of the balloon of 0.77 pounds and the weight of the helium of 0.32 pounds, we get a net lift of 1.2 pounds. Let's check our result by actually measuring the lifting capability. I have a small fish scale, which I'll connect to the balloon here at the nozzle and directly measure the lift. So pulling down on the fish scale right there at the nozzle, I've got one pound, just a touch over one pound of lift. So that's great. That's very close to my calculated value within the resolution of my fish scale. So now we see the power of Archimedes' principle for calculating the lift carrying capacity of a balloon. This allows us to design a balloon mission, and this directly influenced the design of the Breitling Orbiter 3. Now let's toy with the idea of how we might lift ourselves off the ground with a bunch of these balloons. Let's say that the combined weight of me plus a chair plus some tether lines is 200 pounds. How many of these would it take to get me off the ground? Well, all we have to do is divide the payload weight, 200 pounds, by the lifting capability of one pound for each balloon. That gives me, of course, 200 balloons. Not too bad. That actually sounds feasible. And while I do not encourage you to try this kind of flying, some people have done so. For example, Larry Walters pulled just this sort of stunt in San Pedro, California. As a kid, Walters was fascinated by flight, having dreamed of becoming a pilot with the U.S. Air Force. But his vision was poor, and he ended up working as a truck driver instead. So on July 2, 1982, he decided to attempt ballooning flight on his own. He tied 45 eight-foot weather balloons to his lawn chair, sat down with only a parachute, a pellet gun to burst individual balloons as needed, and a CB radio. After cutting the tether, he quickly rose to an altitude of over 15,000 feet. He ended up drifting into the hectic Los Angeles airspace, causing substantial disruption to air traffic in the area. After spending 45 minutes in flight, he decided it was time to come back down. He shot several balloons to decrease the total lift, bringing him back down slowly. On final descent, his balloons got caught in some power lines, 
causing a short blackout for the neighborhood and forcing him to climb down. Of course, the police were there waiting to arrest him. He was fined for flying into controlled airspace without being in two-way communication with air traffic control. Now let's consider what can be done to improve the lifting cap capacity of a balloon. What if we replace the helium inside the balloon with hydrogen, an even lighter gas that is twice as light as helium? It sounds great, but it's important to realize that the lifting force of hydrogen is not twice that of helium, it's only about 10% greater, since the buoyancy force is determined by the weight of the displaced air, and the weight of the gas inside is just offsetting the lifting capability of the buoyancy force. The use of hydrogen is exactly the concept behind the Hindenburg airship that crossed the oceans in the mid-1930s. This massive airship measured over 800 feet long, three times longer than a 747. With a diameter of 135 feet, it had a gas capacity of over 7 million cubic feet, giving it a useful lift of over 22,000 pounds, a little less than 10% of the airship's empty weight. So hydrogen was able to lift a crew of about 40 and about 50 passengers for a powered flight over the Atlantic of 76 miles per hour. Helium, by contrast, would have been able to carry an empty Hindenburg, but no payload at all. Tragically, the selection of hydrogen as the lifting gas led to the shocking demise of the Hindenburg in 1937. As the vehicle was positioning to land at Naval Air Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey, something caused the giant airship to ignite. Fire quickly spread throughout the Hindenburg's hull, fed by the highly flammable nature of hydrogen gas. Although hydrogen and smaller commercial airships had flown without incident, commercial use of hydrogen for buoyancy faded away within a few years. Okay, let's learn more about the flight environment by looking at the launch of a helium weather balloon, like this one. This is a weather balloon launched from the main oval at The Ohio State University. On board our balloon, we have redundant GPS tracking devices, along with a satellite link to view the data in real time. The instrumentation includes sensors for pressure and temperature and video cameras to record the view along the way. Actual pressure and temperature data let us evaluate how those properties vary with altitude. Here we can see the launch of the balloon with the camera suspended underneath. As the balloon rises in altitude, we see buildings and terrain fading from view. As we get to very high altitudes, we can see the curvature of the Earth and the black features of space. At this point, we're on the edge of space, where the atmospheric pressure is only a tiny fraction of what it was at sea level due to an exponential decrease in pressure with altitude. As the balloon ascends to even higher altitudes, the size of the balloon grows. This is because the pressure outside the balloon is decreasing, and the pressure inside the balloon will also need to drop in order to maintain equilibrium. If the pressure inside the balloon becomes larger than the pressure on the outside, then the pressure difference will apply an outward force to the balloon material, causing it to expand. This expansion of the balloon continues as it ascends all the way up to over 100,000 feet, or three times the cruising altitude of commercial airliners. At this point, the balloon is stretched so thin that it bursts. At the point of balloon burst, the payload descends back to Earth via a parachute, although in this case, the parachute got tangled up and the payload came down very quickly. Let's take a look at the data. Here's pressure data directly measured by the balloon. It appears to decrease exponentially with altitude. We can see that more clearly by plotting the pressure data on a logarithmic scale, and the data almost exactly fits a straight line. Since the logarithm is the inverse of the exponential function, this straight line tells us that the pressure variation is indeed exponential. And at the maximum altitude of 107,736 feet, the pressure is just a tiny fraction, about 1%, of what it was at ground level. Now let's take a look at temperature. The temperature decreases as the balloon goes up in altitude, and it does so at a fairly steady rate. This rate, called the lapse rate, is a characteristic that remains fairly repeatable from day to day, even though the absolute value of temperature will vary greatly due to seasonal variation. But then, after this continual decrease in temperature, there is a point at the beginning of the stratosphere where the temperature becomes relatively constant. The stratosphere is a sustained region of isothermal air up to a much higher altitude, 
and is where most airliners cruise. Then at even higher altitudes above the stratosphere, the temperature actually starts to increase again. And finally, we can calculate the density of air using the ideal gas law and our measured values of temperature and pressure. Despite the zigzagging nature of the temperature profile, the density of air shows a continuous decrease as altitude increases. Now that we've seen the characteristic properties of the atmosphere, let's see if we can come up with some analytical expressions that describe the atmosphere. This is important because we need to understand why pressure, temperature, and density vary with altitude. First, all three, pressure, temperature, and density, are thermodynamic properties, meaning that they describe the energy state of the air and how energy is transferred. And changes in the energy of air are part of the critical physics that describe how an airplane can generate lift for flight. Thermodynamics also governs how a rocket engine can burn fuel to produce thrust for liftoff. The thermodynamics of air is based on the composition of air, which consists of a huge number of air molecules. This collection of gases includes nitrogen, oxygen, and a few other small trace elements. The molecules in air are not fixed in space, but are always in continual high-speed motion, with numerous collisions all the time. Temperature is a measure of the energy of the air, and it's the thermodynamic property of air that we're probably most familiar with. More precisely, temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of air molecules that are zipping around within a given volume of air. The hotter the air is, the more kinetic energy these molecules have, and the faster those molecules are moving and colliding with one another. So temperature is a way to measure the energy of air. Density is a measure of the mass of air molecules contained in a given volume of air. If we were to take a collection of air molecules and compress the volume containing them, this would lead to an increase of the density of that air. This is essentially what an air compressor does. When we fire up an air compressor, the compressor pumps the air molecules from the ambient environment and compresses those into a fixed volume. If we just continue to add air molecules to a fixed volume storage tank, the density of air inside the tank will go up. Air pressure is a measure of how much force the air molecules are exerting on a surface. So it is one of the most important parameters for aerodynamics. Pressure is a measure of how much force the air molecules are exerting on a surface. We express pressure as force per unit area. It directly results from collision of these air molecules with the surface. Each time an air molecule collides with a the surface, there's a change of momentum of that molecule. This momentum change comes from changes in the air molecule's direction of flight, or velocity, or both. The net effect of many collisions is a force acting on the surface and pressure is a measure of that force per unit area. We saw from our balloon launch data that the pressure decreases exponentially with altitude. In everyday life, we would say that the air is thinner at higher altitude. A small plane without a pressurized cabin, such as a Cessna Skyhawk, should only be operated below 12,500 feet. Beyond that, you need a pressurized source of oxygen since there isn't enough oxygen at those high altitudes. This lack of oxygen is termed hypoxia and can have grave consequences for pilots. I've experienced minor effects of hypoxia myself, even while flying at altitudes of around 11,000 feet. With the thin air, there is less oxygen and physiological functioning deteriorates. Night vision goes first, but then cognitive ability diminishes. What is so insidious about hypoxia is that it is difficult to detect and the onset can be rapid. When I'm flying at these high altitudes, anything above about 10,000 feet, I'm careful to tra track how I'm doing by monitoring my oxygen levels with a pulse oximeter. Larger aircraft will actually pressurize the cabin in order to deliver enough air for the crew and passengers to avoid hypoxia. The equivalent altitude to which the high-flying cabin is pressurized ranges between 6,000 and 8,000 feet. But smaller aircraft usually don't have the complex structure and systems associated with cabin pressurization. So in these small aircraft, the passengers must wear a mask and get oxygen from a supplemental source. The FAA says that someone sitting quietly in a depressurized plane at 22,000 feet has about 10 minutes of useful consciousness before scarcity of oxygen causes the brain to shut down. You can think of this as the time to don your oxygen mask. And that window of useful consciousness drops sharply at higher altitudes, commonly used by commercial flights. At 25,000 feet, 
someone sitting still has only five minutes before hypoxia takes over. At 30,000 feet, it's only one minute. And at 40,000 feet, you have only about 25 seconds of useful consciousness to get your mask on. Thus, it's imperative for a pilot to quickly don an oxygen mask as soon as the first hint of cabin pressurization malfunction is detected. Cabin depressurization and subsequent hypoxia is the cause of an accident that took the life of champion golfer Payne Stewart and five others on October 25th, 1999. He was one of four passengers in a Learjet 35 bound from Orlando, Florida to Dallas, Texas. As the aircraft was climbing out from Orlando, there came a point where the pilots stopped talking with air traffic controllers. The Learjet missed a turn on its flight plan and continued flying straight ahead for a long time. Fighter jets intercepted the unresponsive flight, but weren't able to rouse the pilots on the radio or by visual cues. Ultimately, the Learjet ran out of fuel over open terrain in South Dakota and crashed into a field, taking the lives of all aboard. The wreckage was so marred that the NTSB investigative team couldn't pin down the exact cause of the incident. But it seemed clear that the aircraft had suffered a dip depressurization event and the crew may not have donned their oxygen masks quickly enough. Hypoxia set in, the crew's cognitive abilities shut down completely and essentially knocked them out. The aircraft was then left to proceed on autopilot until the point of fuel exhaustion. In response to incidents such as the crash that took Payne Stewart's life, Newer aircraft have built-in features that can help rescue a pilot from a hypoxia event. The automated systems work like this. When the aircraft is above a certain critical altitude where the air is thin, the flight computer will prompt the pilot to press a button on a periodic basis. If the pilot is unresponsive, the autopilot will command an automatic descent and turn 90 degrees away from the flight path. The rapid descent aims to bring the pilot back down to a safe altitude where, hopefully, consciousness can be regained. And the 90-degree turn is an abrupt maneuver that will alert air traffic control to the incident. So oxygen is critical. There's very little of it at high altitude, so aircraft have to be pressurized to keep you alive. If the cabin loses pressure, be sure to put on that mask. And when the airline crew tells you to secure your own oxygen mask first before assisting those around you, they really mean it. The reason is that you need oxygen as soon as possible. If you don't get that oxygen, then you may not be able to help anyone else around you, and you'll all suffer from acute hypoxia. Now, as we move farther and farther away from the Earth's surface, the air becomes so thin or rarefied that it essentially becomes a vacuum. The fundamental reason that pressure decreases with increasing altitude is that air at higher altitudes has less air above it that is weighing down upon it. It's helpful to think of an infinitely tall column of air. For clarity of our mental picture, let's think of ourselves as being outside on a calm day with a clear view of the sky. We can see straight up to the heavens. The lateral dimensions of the column don't matter. We'll take it for granted that the pressure on all sidewalls of the air column is the same. For now, let's focus on the base of this column of air and think of a small slice of limited vertical extent that gives us a box of air at the base of this column. This air within this box has some weight associated with it due to the acceleration of gravity pulling down on the mass of air molecules contained within the imaginary box. This weight of air then is exerting a force on the base of the box and the base is exerting a reaction force on the box of air. Now here's the critical part. The box of air is also supporting the weight of all of the air above it. Think of all of the air boxes stacked up with all of their air molecules in them, extending all the way up to the heavens. The air in our box must be able to support the weight of all of the air above it. This force exerted on our box of air directly results in the pressure of air within the box. The pressure produces a force which supports the weight of all the air above it. If we go up in altitude, there is less air above us, so there is less weight that must be supported. So we see that pressure is a direct result of having to support the weight of all the air above it. Now it's important to recognize that even gravity decreases very slightly as altitude increases. Newton's law of gravitational acceleration states that gravity is everywhere according to the following law. The gravitational force attracting two bodies is proportional to the product of the mass of the two bodies and inversely proportional to the distance between them. This is why gravity is not a constant but decreases ever so slightly as we move upward within the atmosphere.
This change in gravitational acceleration is pretty small here on Earth, even on Mount Everest. But think about Steve Fawcett setting a world altitude record for glider flight at 50,722 feet. If he weighed 200 pounds here on Earth, he would lose one pound by the time he got up to his record altitude. We know this from Newton's second law, which states that weight is equal to the mass times the gravitational acceleration. Since mass remains the same, but gravitational acceleration is decreasing with altitude, the weight goes down. So when you're flying high in a commercial airliner, you weigh ever so slightly less than you do here on Earth's surface. This sounds like a pretty easy weight loss program. We'll now write a formal expression for the variation of pressure with altitude. The derivation of this equation is based on our idea of a box of air within this infinitely high column. The expression states that a small change in pressure is equal to the density times the gravitational acceleration times the change in height. This incredibly simple and useful relationship is called the hydrostatic equation. Hydro, since it deals with fluids, and static, since the fluid is not moving. Now we can compare the data recorded by our high altitude balloon with the results of the hydrostatic equation. And the level of agreement between the two is excellent. So the variation of pressure with altitude is very predictable and well known. Now the hydrostatic equation can be used in many ways. For example, the variation of pressure with altitude predicted by the hydrostatic equation is so reliable and consistent that this is the most accurate method of measuring an airplane's altitude. Aircraft determine their altitude by measuring the local pressure and converting it to a height based on this equation. Now to pull together everything we've been discussing, let's turn to what has been called the last great aviation challenge of the 20th century, achieved by the Breitling Orbiter 3. Flown by aeronauts Bertrand Picard and Brian Jones, the Breitling Orbiter 3 was the first balloon to circumnavigate the globe on a flight lasting from March 1st to 22nd, 1999. They traveled over 25,000 miles nonstop, climbing to altitudes exceeding 38,000 feet and achieving ground speeds as high as 161 knots, which is 185 miles per hour. Now, speeds express, expressed in knots may not be too familiar, but in aviation, this is how most speeds are reported. Let's pause for a moment to point out why knots are commonly used for wind speeds as well as aircraft speeds. A knot is simply a nautical mile per hour which is about 15% faster than a mile per hour. This is because a nautical mile is a bit longer than a mile that we're all familiar with. A nautical mile is 6,076 feet long, while a regular mile is 5,280 feet long. The nautical mile has its roots in seafaring and is formally defined as 1 60th of a degree of latitude, also known as a minute of latitude. So knowing that the Breitling orbiter traveled at 161 nautical miles per hour, tells us immediately that it traveled two degrees and 41 minutes of arc during one hour. The Breitling Orbiter balloon envelope measured a staggering 180 feet tall when inflated, while the pressurized capsule suspended beneath only measured just about 16 feet long and seven feet in diameter. Now, was this a helium balloon or a hot air balloon? Yes and yes, it was both. For long distance flight, this combination of helium for lift during the day and a hot air compartment to increase buoyancy at night makes it possible to carry less fuel for the hot air adjustments. And unlike a typical helium balloon, it was possible to maintain altitude without needing to drop sandbags or other ballast at night and without releasing helium in the day to bring altitude back down. To accomplish their flight, Picard and Jones took shifts flying the balloon and sleeping while confined to their tiny quarters. Even though the capsule was heated, the crew had to endure temperatures that dipped below freezing, at times chipping away ice from delicate circuitry. And with the ambient pressure outside the capsule hovering in the vicinity of three pounds per square inch, or just 20% of sea level pressure, Picard and Jones had to artificially pressurize their cabin in order to have enough air to breathe. Unlike a balloon whose lift carrying capacity is due to the weight of air displaced by the lighter than air vehicle, an airplane is heavier than air. So to understand how airplanes work, in the next lecture we'll turn to how aerodynamic forces generate lift.